let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually say right. around. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it is actually in place. It is that process yeah. that a developer, or let's say, a as the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Welcome to the Level Up Hour, where we discuss all things containers, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. I'm Randy Russell, and I am joined by my co-hosts, uh, Jafar Charibi and Mr. Scott McBrien. Uh, hello, gentlemen. How are you today? Good morning, Randy. I've missed you guys. I've not been able to participate for a little bit here, but I'm back now. And I am very excited about our show today because we are covering, you know, that reality of life is that we don't do things once. We don't get to just deploy and forget. No, 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 no. We have to upgrade container images. We have to do it in production. And so, you know, if you're new to container management, maintaining container image life cycles might seem a little bit complicated. Uh, might even be intimidating, not not for our audience. They're they're brave souls, each and every one. But um, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, how you man maintain container images over time. Uh, you know, we're going to look at the Red Hat ecosystem catalog and container catalog, and just talk about uh, you know upgrading and automating upgrades, and certified container images, and something called the Container Health Index, which, you know, in the modern era, you know, the past two years, anything that has health index in the, in the phrase makes me very, very nervous. But I'm sure it is, I'm sure it's entirely benign. So anyway, audience, uh, if you will, if you have any questions as we're going along, uh, please do post your questions uh, in chat. And uh, also please do remember to like, subscribe and share so that everybody knows we're here. Uh, every other week with Level Up Hour. So let's get to it. Scott, where first thing we be, even begin? I think the first place where we begin is like, where do you get your containers, right? So you could choose to build them yourself and that's perfectly viable. And then you have your own uh, ownership of prod production, product, wow, need more coffee. Uh, your own ownership or production of those images, and you could set pretty much whatever you want for your maintenance cadence and processes and procedures. Uh, but most people choose to start with a base image first. And there are a couple, couple different places where um, one can get a base image. And I'm sure that some of you can probably guess where one might get a base image. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> probably the most... Uh, the most popular place would be Docker Hub. Uh, so if we take a look at the screen share here, uh, Red Hat has their universal base images um, shown or available via Docker Hub. So, um, sorry, Scott, are you sharing something? Uh, I hopefully I'm just waiting for uh, for our producer to toggle it on. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, Red Hat is a registered verified provider with Docker. Uh, so we are included in the Docker registry and Docker Hub UI. Um, and you can see that we share four images through Docker Hub, the four flavors of UBI. Um, and if you're interested in four flavors, flavors of UBI, we, we had a show, we talked a little bit about them and we'll reference that a bit later. Um, here in Docker Hub, you can kind of look at what the most popular uh, containers are. And if you click on one, you know, you could see kind of how many pulls it's got, uh, if there are any tags that the um, container image has. So we can actually like look at uh, older images that are in the catalog, not just the most current. Uh, and then you can click the, the pull button or use the URL and pull it with a uh, Docker URL. All right. But it turns out, and we can uh, toggle this back off again, uh, so it turns out that um, Docker Hub is our secondary location where we store container images. Uh, we push those four UBI images over there whenever we build UBI images. Uh, our primary location 
is the Red Hat Certified Container Catalog. All right, so if we uh, bring the screen share back in, uh, Red Hat maintains their own container registry. Uh, and we have more containers here than just those four base images, although it also includes those. Um, so a little bit different uh, flavor for how we store the images, information about the images, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, there are other registries out there, um, but Red Hat currently doesn't participate in them. So you might see, for example, some um, CentOS containers in WSL registry. And that is not a, a CentOS image from us. That's someone else who has made a CentOS-based image and put it there. Um, we have been working with Microsoft to, to determine what it would take to get into WSL. But right now, we're <coughs> in very early stages of just like talking about it and trying to figure out like what that looks like for us and how we support it and a variety of other topics that go along um, managing base containers. Scott, uh, if I might, uh, Christoph actually posed a, I think a very relevant question is, do I need an active subscription to use these images? So if you are accessing the universal base image or UBI, uh, those are free to access, free to redistribute. So that's why we have them over on Docker Hub and they're free to access, free to redistribute there on Docker Hub. Uh, UBI and UBI derivative images in the Red Hat Container Catalog are free to access, free to redistribute. However, today, um, not all the software that comes with RHEL is available for UBI. So today, UBI is a subset of RHEL software and it includes a lot of stuff. Um, so for example, it includes <coughs> language runtimes like Node.js or uh, OpenJDK. Um, but it does not include other things like Postgres. For that, you'd have to package and install your own Postgres in it if you want to retain that um, that redistributability. redistributability. <laughs> um, now, there are some images that are subscription only, and those would be the ones that fall into the RHEL catalog of images. So UBI, Free, all good, do what you want. Uh, RHEL, that provides all the package set for RHEL, and you would need a RHEL subscription to access those, and that's actually on their Red Hat catalog page too. So it's very clear whether you need one or you don't need one when you try to, when you try to access it. Well, and we have another question already, barely 10 minutes in, so. Uh, so the question is, Docker Hub is an API, um, using the provided API endpoints for the registry. So, yeah. So, is there a comparable or analogous functionality on the on the Red Hat oh. catalog side? Yeah. So, um, the API on the Red Hat catalog is um, supports most, if not all, of the same calls as the Docker API. So, you could literally take your Docker Hub thing that you're making calls to Docker Hub with and just swing the URL to the Red Hat catalog and generally it should work. Um, what a it turns out there's more, yeah, I used a lot of weasel words there, um, but there's more metadata and other things in the Red Hat catalog of how we track images and image health and some other stuff that would not be included in Docker Hub metadata. So, um, so that's something that may be differential between the two. All right. All right. So now that we talked about where to go, um, maybe we like just delve in and find one in the Red Hat container registry and we talk some about how we manage those. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull up uh, UBI based images. All right. And you can see that we have uh, RHEL 7 based UBI images, RHEL 8 UBI based images. There's even a RHEL 9 beta one. Um, and when RHEL 9 is released, those will obviously be moved out of beta as well. So let me just pull up the UBI 8, this guy. <coughs> All right, so recall when we looked at the uh, Docker catalog, the big metric that was shown on the page was pulls. And generally when somebody is looking for quality of image, in Docker Hub, I think they generally look at pools. So the more pools it has, 
the more popular it is, the more popular it is, clearly the better it is. Um, and that we have other uh, mechanics embedded in the Red Hat catalog for providing more depth of quality there. Um, so number one is we also uh, include when the container image was generated. Um, we also have the health index, and I'll come back to this in a second, um, as well as size. The other information that we get is stuff like security. So this goes in a little bit more detail about the health index. I'll come back to it. Um, a little bit of metadata about the content. Uh, these are all of the RPMs that we used to build the container image. So uh, RHEL UBIs and RHEL images are actually built out of the same RPM software that we use for building RHEL, rather than like unzipping tar archives and other things that could be in other base images. Uh, we also provide to you a Docker file. So like if you want to build your own, he here's the Docker file you can download and it will uh, when <coughs> using a build from Docker file option, perhaps uh, it will make the same thing. Um, and then under get this image, this is how you can pull it. And you can see that there's instructions for using OC, which, uh, which Jafar is going to get to a little bit later in the episode, uh, and Podman, depending on whether you're doing OpenShift stuff or uh, RHEL container host stuff. Um, and then you can also use Docker if you're using something like Docker Desktop or the Docker tools on your system. All right, and then the last thing, uh, we provide source containers. We had an episode where we talked about this as well. Um, so we, we tell you where to get the source code for the packages that we ship with it. Okay. There are literally so, no mysteries here. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> we try to be as transparent as possible, right? Well, yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at, is that, is that this is really the, the, the wonderful thing. Uh, in the world of open source as you you know as you were going through all the various pieces of information and how much insight there is into what you're getting that is about transparency there there shouldn't be any mysteries in there right um so in a previous episode um episode 57 we talked about choosing the right image right so there's four ubi images um minimal micro which is even smaller regular and init or multi-service image and we talked about why you would choose one over the other in that episode so if you're interested in like more information on the four flavors of ubi and why you might choose one over another i would recommend that you go and take a look at that episode um, there's also other images that we have here in the catalog that include the language runtimes and i'll show you one of those in just a second um, but those others that include language runtimes are based on ubi so I promised that we'd come back to the health index. So Finally. the health index, I know, I know. The health index is uh, basically how we gauge the quality of this image. And you can see that for this image, we have a, a Red Hat bug advisory outstanding for this image. And it is a severely important uh, security vulnerability based on this advisory. So we could go in and like look at what it is and determine um, what we want to do about it. So because of that outstanding CVE, uh, this container has a health index in, uh, of B, um, meaning it's not the best, right? The best would be A. Some other things that we use for gauging the health index would be the length of, um, or I should say the, differential between builds and uploads. So the longer the container image sits in the catalog, the worse its health index will get over time. So if you have something that's been there a year, just because it's been there a year and not been rebuilt, it's going to have a lower health index. In fact, that might be like an E or an F because typically you want things to be maintained. Um, so to, to address that for the Red Hat managed images, we rebuild the UBIs and derivative images every six weeks, just generally. And then if there is something like what we see with this one, where there's a critical or important security CVE outstanding for it, uh, when the remediation for that CVE is available, we will rebuild the printed <coughs> images. So every six weeks is our general schedule, uh, but if there is a reason to rebuild sooner than that because of a critical or important remediation for a CVE that's been published, we will rebuild sooner than that. 
Uh, so I expect this one to be rebuilt once we have a remediation for this uh, CVE for OpenSSL libs, um, and then we'll upload it, and then we'll push it to Docker Hub. So we rebuild in the Red Hat catalog first, and then um, pretty much every day, or, or actually multiple times a day, we push updated images over to Docker Hub as a plug. All right, and to give you an example of what a really ugly one looks like, uh, let's look at like this super old one from eight months ago. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this one has uh, one important and two moderate CVEs outstanding for it because of its age, and we can see that it's a health index of C. Right, I say just generally, I would choose a, a container image that's a, an A or a B would be my preference. Um, C C's looking a little bit sketchy. Um, and then if we look at some other container images, like maybe the Node.js image. So here's the Node.js 12 image built on UBI uh, 8. And we can see that it is also a health index B, probably for that very same security errata. So once we have uh, remediated that, all these derivative images will also be updated uh, to go Again, a lot of transparency there. Um, you know, it, even even to the extent that uh, these images that maybe have more CVEs and really perhaps shouldn't be in active usage, they are still there, and it is possible to, in a sense, kind of see the provenance of a particular image over time, right? Uh, absolutely, and we, the reason that they're still there is sometimes people will build their um, life cycle stuff to pull a specific tag of image, right? So if they used this tag, which is the version information, when they did a pull to then build their stuff into the container and move onward, if we just did away with this tag and this image, that would break their build process, right? Right. So it would be a denial of service attack. <laughs> well, hey, well, let's not go there. But uh, um, I'm, I'm kidding. But you see my point, though, is that if you start doing that, or if you start just one day, you take an image that might have some, some outstanding CVEs and you simply yank it from existence, you've effectively done worse than what might have actually happened with the, the issue itself, right? Possibly. Possibly. Oh, possibly. stop splitting hairs. I'm having fun here. It's Wednesday morning. Come on. All right, continue. So, you know, while we keep that in place and we allow people to continue to use it, of course, recommended practice would be that you periodically check back with the catalog and pull the latest, right? And rebuild your stuff based off the latest tag. Um, and that'll make sure that as we do these rebuilds, you will in your automated rebuild process at your own facility where you're putting your stuff in the containers, you'll start with one of those fresher images and, uh, and build it out. Latest and greatest. Yeah. Um, and then plus as an added bonus, you know, containers, are a uh, very persistent entity, all right? So just because you pull down the latest and you build your stuff into it and you deploy it and it doesn't work, well, you still have your older one in your local library or your, your local uh, repositories. So you can always revert back to that like known good state of container if there's some kind of issue. And that's something also to account for when you're building rebuild processes. It's like, how long do you keep an image um, you know, my recommendation would not be to just like, oh, there's a latest, pull it down, rebuild it, throw away the old image and <laughs> deploy the new one, right? You want to have that kind of backup ability to roll back. Right. All right. Um, so we talked about rebuilding. We talked about how we actually like show you when things are vulnerable um, and a little bit on some of the additional features. Uh, so at this point, I would mention that we also did a level up our episode, episode 55, on configuring auto updates of containers for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So in that episode, we talked about setting up some system D configuration <laughs> so that periodically your machine would check with the Red Hat Container Registry or your own local registry, if that's how you configured it, uh, to see if there's a newer image available. And if so, it would pull down and redeploy your container images based off of that change in state. 
Um, and Jafar, I know that there's um, some OpenShift stuff that can do a similar process. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> so what you've what what you've explained so far is that. Uh, there are uh, frequent releases to the uh, container uh, images that we provide in the Red Hat catalog. And as uh, probably uh, you all know, OpenShift um, does um, rely on those images for everything that is going to run on the container uh, by default, of course. Uh, you can enrich it and add your own images, but uh, most of the time what you're going to end up doing is using those images that we provide as we call base images to build upon and have your applications running on top of those images that we provide. So the interesting thing that would be um, uh, that we offer for our OpenShift customers is that there are some um, automated mechanisms that allow you to uh, uh, pull those updates from the uh, registry. And um, we use some concepts that we call image streams and image stream tags to basically have dynamic pointers from our OpenShift cluster to those images that are on um, the Red Hat um, catalog. So uh, if you want, I can do a quick demonstration uh, and um, try to make those concepts a little bit more visual. A live so, demo? Yeah, always crazy, crazy things. <laughs> live and, what could possibly go wrong? And let's see how it goes. So um, yeah, first step is to be able to share the screen. <laughs> All right. A serious moment in a live demo. Okay, cool. So can you see my screen as, uh, yeah, let me just move the window there. Okay, cool. So um, as you can see here, I have uh, an OpenShift project where I have a Node.js uh, application. This um, Node.js application has been built based upon a, um, node image that comes from the Red Hat catalog. And the way we can check that is I have a build config, which is basically uh, what we use to define how the application is going to be built. So that says that this image is based off an image stream tag. So a tag is basically, an image stream tag is basically a dynamic tag that points to a specific <coughs> image. Um, and this one, point to the OpenShift uh, image that is Node.js 14 UBI 8. So that's what uh, Scott has explained. We have different flavors and this one is using the UBI 8 version and Node.js runtime uh, 14. So if we check that image uh, in the registry uh, or yeah, in the internal uh, registry, we see that now we are in the OpenShift namespace and that's by default where all those uh, images that are used by all the uh, projects are stored. And I can see a list of tags. So I see that there's a tag here called UBI8 that points basically to, um, to a version of the image that has been uh, a little bit outdated. So let's have a look at the image. So currently it's pointing to this tag, which is <coughs> 163. And I see here on the catalog that there's an updated image and then they, they recommend to move to that, to that container, uh, to that image tag instead. So what I want to do now is I'm going to update the um, image that I have that is being used by, by this application. And I want to see what happens OpenShift, uh, I do that. So how do we uh, sync our uh, OpenShift images with the ones that come from the catalog? Uh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually tag the current uh, image stream that is in the OpenShift namespace and point it to the latest tag that we have just seen here. Okay, so basically, there's the OpenShift tag command. I want to add this new tag to my OpenShift uh, image. And that's the Node.js 14 UBI image stream that is used by my application, okay? So I'm updating it here. And as I do that, you can see that OpenShift has automatically detected 
that the image that the application has been uh, based upon has been updated. And now it's running a new build of my application. As soon, uh, uh, sorry, it's, uh, yeah, our, I'm looking at the build now. It's rebuilding the image based on uh, the, the application image based on that base image. And as soon as it's finished, it's going to redeploy that application on my uh, namespace. So the reason why we've been able to do that is the build config has been configured to be re-triggered if there's an image change. So basically, we've detected that we updated the image stream that this application was based on. Uh, and because we allowed that behavior, which is allow to, the build to be triggered on an image change, we have detected that we have rebuilt the application based on the new image, and we have deployed it uh, to, to the Op OpenShift namespace. So of course, uh, so first thing is, yeah, you can see that it's dynamic, it's great. Uh, this is a very simple use case where I'm only updating the application that runs in my dev environment. But of course, if you were to do that in a production environment, you would have your CI CD pipeline get kicked off when this image change, changes. So now we have kicked off a simple build config, but in a more realistic uh, environment that will kick off the CI CD pipeline itself. And I would have all of those uh, tests run in different in staging, uh, et cetera. And then once everything is satisfied, the application gets um, redeployed into the projection environment based on that uh, updated image. So yeah, basically that's what I wanted to show you. And those are the main concepts that we wanted to cover. If I wanted to um, um, frequently update those images, that are in OpenShift from the catalog. There's a dash dash scaled uh, parameter that we can add when we tag an image. And what, when you do that, so for instance, if I do instead of just OC tag, I do dash dash scaled, it's going to frequently update the image. And uh, by default, it's uh, a 15 minutes time frame where we are going to pull those. Uh, remote images and check if uh, there's an update and if so, automatically import that content to uh, OpenShift. All right, so that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And yes, before anything goes wrong. Yeah, exactly. So far, it's been working, so that, let's stop there. <laughs> stop all we're at. 100% of the time works every time. That's what I like yeah. to see. Exactly. Um, so, Jafar, I know that both of us have kind of gone through and said, use the latest, use the latest. Um, is oh, there yeah. ever times in the OpenShift world where you don't use the latest? And what, what might be a consideration for that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I would say most of the time well, we don't use the latest. because um, So there are, there are two things. Use the latest is um, a, a good practice to update the base images uh, because uh, that somehow per, uh, provides you updates uh, for the CVEs that we've able to we've been able to uncover and fix, etc. So it's a good practice to update those images to the latest ones. But what we do provide uh, with the image stream tags is that you don't have to call your image stream latest for it to point to the latest image. So in your application lifecycle, uh, a good practice is to never use latest because <laughs> you then don't actually know what's in your application anymore because anyone can update the tag latest and you don't have any more a versioning of your application. So usually what happens is your base image is going to point to the latest image that we provide from Red Hat, but your application that has been built is going to be tagged with your commit ID, for example, uh, to, to be able to trace back the image to, uh, to the uh, uh, 
commit in the Git repository, for instance. And you can then add a, an application version tag that says version 101 or something like that. And those are the tags that are going to be used by your CI CD process to basically update uh, the deployments uh, of your uh, images. Because that way you have more control uh, over the history of your deployments and you can trace back things to uh, both image changes and to uh, code changes if you go back to commit uh, IDs and such things. In a sense, latest turns into a black box if that's the if that's the yes. thing you use. And so yeah, if and you, you want to find yourself in that situation, which is pretty typical, where you have to trace back, okay, things are not working now, or we are having an issue now. Let's go back and try to reconstruct what it is or where that happened. It's like latest gives you a brick wall where you lack the clarity about being able to see past it about specifically what that that tagging was am i getting that about right yeah exactly exactly yeah so um <clears throat> but again uh one interesting thing also with the image stream tags is that although um i mean if you've been um pointing the latest tag to a specific image you can always because it's a dynamic pointer you can say okay so we've messed up here and i want to change the default the, the latest tag now to point to an earlier version of my application and then then you can still manage that situation but it's it's always better to have a very um, semantically clear tag to be able to know where you're at with your application versioning and such things all right so it's kind of interesting to consider you know we had scott's presentation about a, you know, a very non open shift, non Kubernetes approach to, you know, this whole topic of updating and everything. And then we added the open shift piece. And there's actually an area of intersection, first of all, that I'd say is that, you know, if you have a particular image, that image is tagged and has a lot of the characteristics as viewed through open shift that you yep. would if you were doing it through through one of the registries. So that's that's a common area. It seems to me, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong here, Jafar, mm -hmm. it seems to me that really what you get on the open shift side is you start to have a little bit more of that life cycle capability when it comes to CI, CD, and how you are actually managing this, not narrowly from just the, the perspective of, okay, well, here's my container and I'm updating it, but rather through the whole exercise of saying, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that and I'm going to rebuild in dev and then I'm going to rebuild in test and then I'm going to rebuild in stage and I'm going to put it in prod. Would that be a fair characterization that that's really the piece that OpenShift gives you incrementally when you take that approach? Yeah, definitely. So um, uh, OpenShift provides uh, a lot of capabilities um, uh, we, we, we've spoken about uh, automated pipelines using Jenkins or using um, OpenShift pipelines, which is based on Tekton. So that allows you to have uh, full production grade uh, CI CD pipelines that are uh, kicked off on OpenShift and that can um, trigger things within OpenShift itself, but also outside <coughs> of OpenShift. And they can also interact with registries that are in OpenShift or outside of uh, outside of it. And uh, so, for example, uh, you know that we provide the Red Hat Quay registry, which is, I would say, a more production grade and high availability geo-replicated registry that you can use for your um, deployments um, by, as a as an upgrade to the internal registry that we provide. It, it does allow you to have integrated security scans and such things. And uh, you can configure OpenShift to automatically um, push and pull data from a remote uh, Quay registry. So that will enhance the capabilities with uh, even better um, security scans uh, results within your, uh, your re registry. So we've seen that we provide, for instance, the container health index uh, on the Red Hat catalog, which is uh, very useful to be able to understand um, the quality and the security 
uh, implications of a specific uh, version or tag of an image, but it doesn't translate automatically as is to OpenShift registry because we don't show those security um, results in OpenShift itself by default. But if you do use the uh, Red Hat Quay registry that provides those capabilities, you are now able to not only um, have your uh, results uh, displayed in the registry, but they can also dynamically be used as a security gate in your pipelines. So for instance, you can, um, you can uh, kick off the build of your new uh, image uh, within the pipeline. And then you can say, if there are security issues that have a critical severity, then the pipeline won't go uh, further because I have defined a policy within my pipeline to prevent the application from being promoted if a specific, um, I would say, uh, criteria is met, criteria, yeah. security criteria. So yeah, that, that provides you with the, these types of capabilities where you can shift into what we call DevSecOps and um, also with the addition of the uh, Red Hat uh, Advanced Cluster Security for Kubernetes or what we call ACS. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, it also provides you uh, additional capabilities in terms of security scanning and uh, applying security uh, violation policies, uh, uh, et cetera, to your, to your applications. So yeah, we do provide, I would say, these notions of CVEs in the Red Hat catalog. But if you are using the combined value of uh, OpenShift with uh, Quay, ACS, and the CI-CD pipelines, you can have uh, a more, I would say, robust and DevSecOps approach uh, where uh, things are automated, where you have uh, ga gates to prevent uh, security uh, issues from being propagated to uh, to the other uh, environment, and you know, yeah. So that's yeah. I would say the overall value that you can get from that. Right. Well, that yeah, that provides a lot of clarity. So Scott, we lost you for a bit there, and now you're towering down at us. Um, <laughs> yeah, I trying to trying to be intimidating. I saw the power company trucks on my street earlier this morning, and I went, hmm, I wonder if that's going to be a problem. Apparently, the answer was yes. <laughs> um, so we're, I'm slowly regaining power again. Ah, but well. OK, so uh, you know, uh, any, any additional thoughts, questions, concerns, or commentary from you? Uh, I mean, because as you were offline, I'm sure you had a lot of time to sort of think about these subjects in greater depth. Well. Before we left, uh, we were talking about like always latest or not. And, and I wanted to point out that um, while, and Jafar made the same point, right? Pulling your base images um, and getting those updated so you remediate those CVEs is, is important. Um, but notice that in the catalog, we do things like carry Node.js 12 or 14 or 16. And we continue to update the um, Red Hat bits underneath of that and even the Node.js stuff but we keep it at that like Node.js 12 or Node.js 14 um, version. Right. So you don't always have to run like the latest Node.js on the latest uh, container image. We allow you to have the choice yeah. of what runtime um, on which version of image. We even still do support of uh, Realm 7 images at this point, although time, time is running out on those. We only have uh, a couple of years left on their life cycle. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so just speaking about that, uh, uh, if you've been uh, able, uh, uh, familiar with the .NET, uh, uh, what's the .NET uh, version that runs on Linux, .NET Core, uh, you've probably seen that, uh, you know, there are some breaking changes when you move from a version to another one. And one of my previous demos was based on .NET Core latest, so I've I hadn't run that demo for years and decided to come back and pull it off. And while I uh, tried to rebuild the application that was pointing to latest, it tried to pull like the version six of .NET Core 
which is not called doc, .NET Core anymore, because that's what the latest tag in OpenShift was updated to. And of course, it broke everything. Uh, the application was not running or building anymore because there was such a huge change between .NET Core uh, 2 or 3, which I was using, and the sixth version. So by uh, going to my build uh, config and, and specifically saying, do not use .NET Core latest, but use .NET Core version 2, I've been able to very easily rebuild my application and have everything running uh, together. Because as you said, we do provide an image stream that is called .NET Core. But within that, we do provide several versions that range from, uh, you know, depending on how far uh, back in the um, component itself, uh, we are going to support the, the versions. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a very useful um, uh, feature that we provide. And also from a support standpoint, we are able to, to, to give you different versions of those uh, runtimes and make it easier for you to, to consume. Right. So that's an example of when not to use the latest tag. <laughs> a textbook example based on the description mm -hmm. you gave. All right. Well, gentlemen, yes. uh, this is just, just uh, well, uh, another comment uh, speaking about managing the images uh, lifecycle. Uh, so something that we haven't spoken about is um, the, the Quay um, integration that we have with OpenShift and so as mentioned, there's a bi-directional uh, integration where OpenShift uh, Quay can become the default registry for, for OpenShift. Uh, but we also have a mirroring capability in Quay that allows you to use it, for example, to mirror those Red Hat catalog images. So basically you are going to use Quay as your source of truth but you can have those images that you are going to use in Quay mirrored from the Red Hat catalog. So they are going to periodically get updated, scanned for CVEs, etc., and used by OpenShift as the default source for, for, for the images. All right. Um, we did have a question that if we could tackle this before we wrap up, it'd be great. Um, and that is, you know, uh, you know, we talked about image stream, you know, our image stream similar to API endpoints, you know, is that something that can be used to search for OpenShift images? Um, so I, I, I don't know exactly what the, what the, 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 the meaning of the question is, but, um, the image stream is basically a, something that we added on top of uh, OpenShift to allow you to have the, this notion of dynamic uh, tags. So an image, you can think of an image stream as a collection of image stream tags. And an image stream tag is basically as, as a, a Docker image tag, except that an image stream tag is something that you can change over time and it's dynamic. It's, it's not a static uh, reference to a Docker or a container image, for, for instance. It's a dynamic reference that you can uh, use. And the image stream is basically just a collection of image stream tags. So basically, uh, say for, for instance, that you have an application that uses three components. You have a front end, front end a middleware, and a back end. The front end, is going to have different versions. And all the images that are uh, built, they are going to be pushed to the front-end image stream. And whenever you create a new version, you are going to create a new image stream tag, which is front-end uh, dash uh, uh, or uh, yeah, 1.1, 1.2, et cetera. So the image stream tag is the equivalent of a container image tag. And an image stream is just a way of regrouping those uh, image stream tags together. All right. Well, thanks for asking the question view style. Um, gentlemen, I think we're going to be going a little bit short today. We're at the level up hour, but that doesn't mean we will always necessarily be an hour. Um, 
Scott, any parting thoughts from the world of Rel? Uh, no, it, enjoy your redistributable UBI container images based on Rel. <laughs> All right then, Jafar, anything else you want to add? I think we've covered the, the, the main uh, topics. So thanks again, uh, everyone. Right. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us. Again, remember to like, subscribe, and share. We're here every Wednesday, every other Wednesday, rather. Uh, and so uh, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your kids. And uh, we will see you next time on the Level Up Hour. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.